Okay, Tom, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. You? Yeah, excellent. So we're here for episode 12 of the Primary Physio Podcast with Tom Bracher from Gracie Baja Sutton Coalfield. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, Tom has recently opened up his own uh, Gracie Baja BJ, BJJ school in the Sutton Coalfield area. It's the only school uh, that teaches BJJ in and around Sutton. Uh, Tom's one of the youngest instructors in the West Midlands. Um, he's got quite an accolade of previous competition titles behind his belt. Uh, in terms of his lineage, he takes his brown belt and all of the rest of his promotions from Professor Victor Estima, which is Gracie Baja Nottingham. And uh, today we're going to talk about how you got into uh, jiu-jitsu, how things are going with your school in terms of uh, trying to coach and teach in the current COVID-19 environment and, and the challenges that you might be facing. And uh, we're also going to talk about a little bit about your background and how jiu-jitsu is going to help you turn things around. Uh, also, um, we're, the most important bit is how you manage to kind of maintain training and recover from that horrific knee injury that you sustained at the European Championships. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, the floor is yours, mate. Let's uh, let's take it away. How did um, how did you get into BJJ? Um, well, it's quite a, a common uh, story. Let's say uh, I was watching uh, MMA uh, one evening. I think it was uh, I believe I do have to check this, but it was the GSP uh, against Matt Hughes fight. Uh, I was watching it on TV. Never seen MMA before, never even heard of it. Uh, and I was in secondary school at the time. I watched the match and I think it was the first one where he won. And obviously he wrestled really well. And, you know, everybody knows GSP's uh, ground game and wrestling incredible. Um, and then uh, I, asked if, I asked around at school, funny enough, uh, one of my best mates at school at the time, uh, I said to him, I said, oh, you, you know, that MMA thing, do you know what they're doing when they're like on the floor? What is it? Because I didn't even know what it was called. Uh, then I found out it's called uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so I googled um, the most local place, uh, and a place came up that was at um, like a hotel down the road. So I used to turn up to this hotel, and this is a story that um, I tell my students. Wait, which hotel is this? Is this in Sutton or? Yeah, it was the Ramada Hotel, not far from uh, where you went to school. No way. Yeah, Ramada Hotel, um, and it was in like a little function room with some jigsaw mats. Uh, laid out like the old sponge ones um, that are great for cleaning, obviously. And um, so I went there, and this is, like I said, it's, it's, um, a story that I don't tell too many people, and I, I try and tell my students when I'm trying to uh, inspire them to train, or if it's somebody new coming into the academy. Um, my mom would actually drop me off there um, to train for an hour. Um, and the first few times I went, I, I genuinely at that time, I just didn't have the courage to even go in the room. I was that concerned or worried about, you know, what is it going to be like? You know, are people going to be in there like crazy? You know, I just had no clue of what to expect. So I think the first two or three occasions um, that I'd got dropped there, uh, I waited in the reception uh, for the session <clears throat> and it was six pound. You had to pay six pound on the door. Uh, the six pound went in the vending machine. I'll admit to that. <laughs> um, you didn't, didn't even go in. You didn't, didn't go even in. go in. No, I didn't even go in. And um, then she'd come and pick me up, and I'd say, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good class. Like, try and make something up." Uh, but literally, for probably the first three or four times I got dropped off, I didn't even go in. And then the reason I think I went in on the fourth or fifth time was because somebody was coming to, late to the session and noticed me there, and they just asked, "They said, oh, are you waiting around for the jujitsu class?" So I think it started. Um, and then because someone else was there, I thought, oh, okay, this is my way in. Like, this is my way of not being awkward, not, not feeling um, weird or whatever, however I was feeling. So I thought, oh, yeah, yeah I, I'm going to come to the jiu-jitsu class. Uh, and I went in with uh, a guy then, uh, and that was my first ever class in jiu-jitsu. I believe I was about 16 years old. Uh, and obviously, as a 16-year-old uh, teenager, you know, I was overweight, I was out of shape, I was, you know, probably didn't have the most confidence in the world, obviously. Um, that was my first ever experience uh, with jiu-jitsu and, and getting started with it, really. So from watching something on TV, asking a friend about it, and then uh, trying to ease my way into uh, a class for a few occasions, and then eventually doing the first one. So let, let me ask you a couple of questions. When you said you were 16, slightly overweight, and... Um... Yeah. Were you the victim of any bullying or something when you were a kid? Or 
Um, see, this is a, because of the like the reputation I had in school uh, for my behaviour. Because you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I wasn't the uh, best behaved uh, kid in school at all. Uh, and I think that persona kind of went before me anyway. So I don't think anybody uh, like would have tried or attempted to. It was almost like it was like a defence that was there for me. So instead of people bullying me, they would think, oh, you know, he's the, the naughty one in school, we leave him alone. So I didn't suffer too much of any bullying really to any degree. Um, but obviously that self-consciousness and them uh, insecurities and flaws are always, you know, everybody has them of course. And they were probably a motivating factor to why um, maybe my behavior wasn't the best uh, when I was younger or, you know, maybe I didn't feel great about myself. So I wouldn't, you know, do as well as I could in school, but um, I didn't receive any um, bullying really. I wouldn't call it, you know. Okay. But the problem is when you're that kid, you know, yeah. that's it. so much is expected of you to be the first one to get mm. into trouble and, oh, well, he's, he's the tough kid. Let him deal with it. Or Yeah. So if you, if, if, at least if you, I wasn't like the toughest kid. I was just, uh, you know, I like, I always try and say this, like, this is, <laughs> I used to say this is an excuse, but I truly do believe it. Like, it was just a misunderstanding yeah. between me and, you know, the teachers of what, what school I was at. Like, I look back on it now and I teach kids for a living. I teach them jujitsu and, um, you know, I have quite a, a good relationship with them. And there's some kids that come to our academy that are probably not the best behaved at school or anything like that. But we actually have a really good connection because I understand. I don't think there was anyone around that understood how to manage it. Uh, or it manage you. Yeah. So not like, don't get me wrong. They shouldn't have to manage yeah. a kid individually, but there was no one that knew how to calm the situation down or make it easier. It just, they seemed to fuel it in a way. Like it was a constant clash. Okay. Uh, between me and them. So you're in a position now, you're a teacher, you're, you're in a, a position of authority and responsibility. Would yeah. you ever consider going back to the schools that you went to where you obviously, you know, were yeah, so, when you uh, got expelled uh, for it and then say, look, you know, let me speak to the kids. <laughs> let me speak to me. Yeah. That was, let me speak to my, your version of me that was here years ago and let me tell him that, look, there's light at the end of the tunnel, you can turn this round. Or would you not like to go back to the teachers that, you know, potentially you felt didn't understand you and say, look, mm. I'm, doing, I'm okay now. Um, um, I've got a positive message that is jujitsu. Yeah. And I've got, you know, I've got something I'd like to share with everyone. Can I do a talk or? Yeah, that's something I, uh, I'm looking into anyway. Um, I was, this is something that we are in the, the um, background of doing, like, unfortunately due to the current situation with the virus. Yeah. Yeah, and the school's closing. Um, but previously to that, um, we actually have set up a project uh, within my school. This is, I think, this is outside the franchise. This is just for personally my own academy. Uh, we're actually funding um, kids from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds and homes uh, in the local primary school. Uh, they're going to come on their dinner break, and they're going to do an hour's training with myself uh, and some of the coaches that we have at uh, GB Sutton. So. Uh, it's something I've always wanted to do, something I feel deeply uh, passionate and motivated about, obviously, because, you know, if if there's one kid or two or however many um, that are similar in any way uh, and they get the same results or benefits that I have uh, through doing what I do, then, you know, that's all you can really ask for as, uh, as a teacher, as a coach. Uh, that's, you know, I'll, I can't wait until the day where I see somebody that is, like, highly similar I see them go through the same struggles, the same issues, the same. And I kind of know in the back of my, my head and in my heart, like I know that they're going to be okay because I know what, how they're going to react, how they're going to do. Do you know what I mean? Like I yeah. can't wait to see that carbon copy. You see yourself in, in somebody else. Yeah. Let, let, let me ask you this. Who was teaching at the Ramada? Who was that that was running the class? Uh, his name was uh, Bruno Mello. Uh, I still know him now. Um, he was under uh, Roletta or whole letter um that was the academy name uh i like he left then like not long after i started training he went back to uh, brazil uh, and then he was in california with fabio uh, prado and uriah faber um out there um and then i think it was two years ago i bumped into him actually at the europeans in lisbon and that was the first time we would seen each other in forever um and how was, how was that how was that meeting crazy, 
Yeah, yeah. It was a, you know what? Like, it was it was like an emotional moment for me because I'd seen somebody that 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 give me this um, idea or something to follow. Um, they give me this passion, and okay, they, they hadn't given it me to the level uh, that I, I'm used to now. They hadn't given it with the advice that I'm used to now or the um, progression that I see now. But professionalism, they, the level of professionalism. Yeah, they gave me that initial spark, and you know. You can't take that away from anybody. The first person that shows you um, what this is is always going to be uh, special. Your first coach is always going to be special, whether that's the one you stick with forever or whether it's, you know, the one that, you know, you don't. That first coach, I think, is key um, and obviously inspired something in me to continue regardless of whether they were around or not, which I think is, I think that says a lot about you as a coach, um, even if people don't choose to train with you, but you, you know, but they continue to train because of what you've get, given them. I think that, you know, I think that's more of a measure than how many students you've got currently or how many people want to train with you, I think. Uh, yeah. So well, that, this leads on to the next question, which is how did you find Professor Victor Estima? Um, I went on a, a training day. Uh, so I was originally, um, I trained at GB Tamworth for a little bit, like uh, on the evenings. I bumped into Victor at a training day. Like um, They do them now more frequently, but back then it wasn't as, as common. Um, he spoke to me after the session, like I trained with him and watched him roll with a few of the guys from where I was training previously. Um, and he was just on a, you know, in my opinion, it was just a different frequency, a different level. Uh, still to this day, I say that anyway. Like even if we, you know, it's very rare, but even if we do have a close round in the gym or whatever when we're training together, like he's just different, man. Like mentally, physically, uh, like jiu-jitsu wise, he's just on a, this is a different different level is is hot you can't even really explain and um when i seen that for the first time it was almost like i hadn't got to a level yet to understand it so i thought man like surely that's like really easy to stop you know what i mean like i'd see him do something and i think why is the guy not stopped it like because i didn't even have the understanding to even know what the level was um and then, like I said, after that session, he spoke to me. He said, you know, do you want to come over, train in the, in the daytime with our comp team? Um, I tried, I went over a couple of times. Um, what, what belt were you then? Blue. Oh, you, okay. So you went to him yeah. as a blue belt. Yeah, so I went there as a blue belt. Um, and I met up with the competition team uh, there, who were just a room of incredible athletes man like uh give me, some, give me ghost give me some names uh oliver lovell uh sean coates jamie paxman uh vanessa uh english uh who else in there uh gazzy uh gareth neal uh all these all these guys in this room and obviously when i first went over i thought oh you know look like, i'm a good blue belt and uh well i thought i was and i would probably get tapped man like eight times around minimum oh. By everybody. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't understand. How, how many minute rounds? <laughs> like, I think there were sixes at the time. So oh, easily yeah. more than one a minute yeah. I was averaging. Yeah. Um, but like still to this day, it's always something that I will do. However many times I will get tapped in a round, I just make sure that I get up before them, stand up and act as if it didn't happen. And I do that still to this day. If somebody catches me, I stand up before them. I get ready quicker before them. And, you know, if I can't beat you in jiu-jitsu, I'll beat you in you know, looking cool while doing it or mentally or, <laughs> you know what I mean though? But that's just, I have to take these little small wins. So, okay, tap me eight times, but I got up first and I was fitter or whatever it is, I will try and, you know, win somehow. I get a little win somehow. But when I went over there, man, it honestly is incredible. The environment, the training, uh, the people, just a just different level. And um, soon after that, um, I decided to go over there full time. I had a chat with Victor and, you know, the best part about going to Nottingham was being around these people that were uh, a reference point for me uh, to show me that it is possible to live from jiu-jitsu, make a career from it, uh, compete at the highest level. Uh, and I think that was really important to me that I could see other people who had done it, other people like, okay, a few of them were a little bit older. So I thought maybe, you know, it's not something that I can do immediately, but in a few years uh, I can I can gravitate towards um, and then that just instilled like a, a confidence in me that, you know, if my best mates at training can do it, then there's no reason why I can't. And 
equally to this day, there's no reason why anyone else can't because there's nothing, there's nothing special to see. It's just hard work and, you know, a path and that's it. There's no secret. There's no, you know, it's just it's graft. It's just but, graft. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But do you feel if that was the case, then it would be the case at every gym. Do you not feel like what you said, there's a special connection that needs to be formed yeah. with you and your coach? And yeah. What was it? What was it that made Victor Estima so special? And your relationship, and how, as a coach, how do you try and replicate what he's taught you to your students? Because essentially, when they turn up to Sutton, you yeah. are you're a projection of of you're a projection of Vic, Victor's coaching and yeah. you know and his technique and everything that he knows about jujitsu. That's you carrying it on with your own little twist on it, obviously. But, yeah, of course, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But he has kind of like sowed and developed the seed. So yeah. So how, uh, how, would, how would you sum up his kind of, like, how would you describe his level of coaching? And um, I think, like like I say, his level of jiu-jitsu and his level of coaching is something that, you know, is very hard to explain or, you know, even to a certain um, level understand. You know, it, you could take some guys from other gyms uh, across the world, you could put them in that same room and maybe they don't have the same results because they don't have, you know, the, the actual knowledge to understand uh, the level and the level in which, you know, the detail is that he explains uh, and does stuff. But I think the most important thing aside from, you know, because you can be as technically as good in the world as you want, you can be, you know, it can be all these amazing things as a coach. But I think the way he handles himself uh, and the way that, um, you know, he, he interacts and connects with everybody in the team and then it comes back like full circle. So, you know, he will be like a father figure when he needs to. Like I remember the first time I went to the Worlds, uh, I stayed with him. You know, it was waking me up early in the morning, making me go in the shower, making me brush my... Like, you know, literally like militant uh, training, eat, training, eat, go home, shower, bed, like, you know, like that. And then at the same time, there's also the, you know, he's your, your like older brother that you can mess about with, you can have a laugh with, you can, you know, you can take the mick with and he can do it back and you have good banter. Then when I think when you've got those two things and then you add to that like a dream that you both work on, um, I think it's like the most powerful combination you can ask for because if he was just pure militant, it wouldn't work. If you just had banter all the time, there'd be no seriousness, so it wouldn't work. Um, and then obviously the high level technique, if you didn't have that, you wouldn't get where you was going. But the main thing is the way that it all gets pulled together uh, in the team. And whatever my dream is, I truly believe is his dream at the same time while we're working towards it. Whether it is or it isn't, I don't care. I don't know. But he will make it feel that way. So, you know, if I go to him tomorrow and say, look, I want to win ADCC, he's going to do everything in his power to make that happen for me, whether it's by helping me with my training, whether it's by suggesting things outside the map, like whatever he can, he will give it. And there's no, I've never felt with him that I felt with some other places um, outside of GB that he holds back. So he could literally give you every technique in the world, tell you how to beat him, tell you how to, uh, you know, his worst position. Well, he still beat you, of course, but he's not holding anything back. Whereas some places, because of their mindset um, and the way they are, they may, you know, give you enough to make you feel like you're progressing and doing well but they'd never do it enough or give you enough details or information to go on and above and beyond like them and develop think, on their stuff. Do you think that's really true? Do you really, like, have you heard that first hand or have, it, have you experienced that first hand? That's quite, that's quite a statement. I, well, what, I mean, other gyms? Yeah. Well, yeah, not, not in GB. I'm no, saying, no, okay. Right. Place where I trained before. So oh, like, okay. you know, your community centers, your... Right. Right. hotels yeah. they would obviously coach to a level okay and get everybody to a level yeah. but they would never want the level to go above and beyond them in the room good you so know you, what i mean you, you think the bigger picture of uh, uh of master carlos and yeah. gracie baja just mm -hmm. gets replicated through gym and through each professor yeah because it's to evolve isn't it it's not like for example me now i could coach everybody in the gym and i could say oh this is what you do this what, and and i could always try and keep myself as the best Right, I could always try and like, oh yeah, I'm the best, I'm the guy, I'm this, I'm that. I don't want that. I want the person that takes everything from me to develop it, 
um, f- like fix my mistakes even that I have or flaws, make it even better, then pass it on again. And by doing that, every generation uh, that you see of jiu-jitsu becomes, you know, exponentially better because it's just, it's like a, a thing now you can't stop. It's going to grow. It's going to get better. People are going to invent new things, fix old things. And it's just going to keep evolving to a point where if you don't, you know, let go of that ego of, you know, dissolving yourself down to, uh, you know, just a person that's giving something rather than trying to look a certain way, uh, then you get lost anyway and, and you don't really evolve. And I think that's the, the major thing that is the difference for Gracie Barra as a whole from, you know, the top down is to give everything you have, everything you've got, you know, whether it's your biggest secret on how you sweep everyone or if it's your biggest secret on how you always tap someone from this position, you give it out and, you know, on the return of that, we'll come back a lot more from other people uh, developing it and, and also doing the same because if, if you didn't, then no coach would do it. Every coach would kind of keep their cards close to their chest and, and no one would develop or get better. Everyone would just be stuck in their, in their ways, which I think... If you look at the history of jiu-jitsu and, and, and even MMA to a certain degree, I think at the start it was very much like that because it was a competition of who's the best or whose gym's the best or whose affiliation's the best. Um, and then I think you, you didn't really see the full um, potential of jiu-jitsu. And I think now you, we are just starting to see that process of all these online videos. And, you know, you, could, you can essentially train from any academy in the world if you want right now. You can go on there. Uh, live videos, AOJ, Atos, all of these top gyms, uh, GB, you know, we have an online program now too. And you can learn every single technique there is. There's no, you know, hidden secrets and you can become great and then give back and make your own online system if you want in the future or your own gym. And I think that's what the the potential now and the future of it is like, is is going to be amazing. And I can't wait to see, you know, my students, their students, the kids that we teach like you know in 10 years man like I don't even it's impossible to imagine but I I, you know I'm very excited and and I really look forward to seeing what it's going to be like in 10 years because if you go 10 years back and you look at the world champions and you look at the world champions now the difference in game is just like nuts like the I'm not saying that they would beat the ones from 10 years ago I don't know if they would it'd be amazing to see in their primes but uh, the actual games and the levels and the you know, the new guards and using the uniform and using, like, it's mind-blowing, man. It's uh, well, interesting. To see. Imagine going back 10 years in your life when you were 14. Yeah, see, there you go. What would the 24-year-old Tom say to that 14-year-old Tom? Oh, man. I'd say, <laughs> I'd say stop playing on the Xbox. Stop eating bad food and get to the gym. That's what I would say. But, uh, like, I, the thing is, I, I've, I've had this question asked to me before. Uh, and it's a very common question. People ask, oh, what would you say to yourself as a younger person? And in all honesty, like I am genuinely super happy where I am in life right now. Like genuinely, there's no front about it. I'm a very happy person. So I wouldn't really change too much. I wouldn't say too much because those experiences that being overweight, having a struggle, getting in shape, they're going through, you know, multiple schools and behavior systems and programs to, you know, make me who I am right now is you know, I wouldn't change it for the world at all because I wouldn't be who I am and I wouldn't have the experience I have at such a young age. You know, I'm only 24 and, you know, I've done quite a lot. I've experienced quite a lot and I'm still continuing to do quite a lot. And I don't think I would be doing that uh, without those character building experiences like early on. Absolutely. Oh, I mean, it, it, it's quite a young age. Why, why not? Why take a school on? Why not just concentrate on doing what you said and going to win ADCC and all yeah. of these things? Because you see at the top end with these champions and, you know, there's only the very small percentage that do make it. They yeah. are very, uh, there's one trait that they all have in common and that's they're very good at looking after themselves. So yeah. you've kind of done the opposite and gone well i want to i want to develop and build champions but you also mm-hmm. want to be a champion yourself because so it's quite it's going to be quite hard to balance and juggle those two yeah. things but, yeah i agree yeah um the way i look at it and the way i see it is you know as a competitor i'm going to be uh judged on what i win uh and as a coach i'm going to be uh, judged on what my students win or accomplish on or off the map uh and the impact you can have uh and i truly believe you know, I'm not saying I'm special or I'm better than anybody else at all. I'm not. 
uh, but I have the ability to work super hard. I have a different mindset, a completely different um, mental game to everybody else. Okay, physically they may be stronger or fitter, technique-wise they may be uh, better or more technical, but I truly believe mentally there's not a single person, athlete on the planet, uh, that is more mentally strong or diverse in situations when they need to be than myself and that might seem cocky or you know like I have a big ego but it's just true and by doing what I do I'm going to prove that and I'm going to be able to you know show my students in real time what hard work relates to and, and what it gives back to you and I think if I went on a big competition career as an athlete and all I had to worry about was training and winning I would be successful and I think if I just was a coach tomorrow and I didn't worry about winning or competing again, I would be, you know, fairly successful. But I think if you can do both, you know, I've not really seen that done from a young age uh, right now. You know, if I look at the best people in the world, Nogi, you're probably going to say, you know, Gordon Ryan is the best Nogi grappler in the world. Does he have an academy? No. Does he have good financial backing? Yes. You know, does he train three, four times a day? Yes. Um, and that's why he's the best in the world at Nogi. But how many people can you say, He's bringing people through, he's coaching people, he's giving back to his community, you know, he's giving a chance for young people that were in the same position as him or young kids, a chance to change their life and he's winning world titles and putting it all together through, you know, his work ethic, you know what I mean? And the thing is, before I opened an academy, um, I kind of had this conversation um, with myself, with my family, um, uh, with my teammates to a certain degree and, and Victor almost, where... You know, some people can open a gym um, or an academy and they can settle. They can sit back on their belt or they can sit back on their previous accomplishments and they can almost, you know, shut up shop and, you know, and, and rest on that and do well. Or you have some people that don't open an academy. They, they live the best they can. They teach privates to, to get by. Uh, they train three, four times a day. And, you know, they may or may not win a world title also. But, you know, in the last year, uh, this was last year. I built an academy from scratch, from a community centre. I bought a building, uh, you know, at the age of 24. We have a, a big uh, amount of students at our academy. I also, during that process of being at the gym, like 14 hours a day, building it with my bare hands, with my family, took bronze at a world championship in Nogi and lost to, you know, arguably one of the best uh, grapplers going, which was Roberto Jimenez, who's you know, I was beat Keenan the other day, uh, a few weeks ago in the Gi. So, you know, am I going to hinder my performance and winning uh, championships and world titles by having an academy? Probably not, in my opinion. Maybe, you know, towards the top end, like you say, okay, it was only a bronze or a silver or whatever. And it's not that, that pinnacle gold yet. But, you know, I'm, I'm 24 years old and I, in my opinion, I have another at least 10 years uh, to accomplish a black belt world medal or world title. Um, and I can do that with an academy. I could do that without. But like I said, I just want to be able to prove that there's no excuse to not do it because of your circumstance. Like, I could easily say, oh, I could have made it. I could have been a world champion. But, you know, I wanted to give back and own a gym and teach kids. And I think that just becomes um, an easy excuse or an easy way out not to push uh, how you would if you, you know, if you couldn't eat. And I think, you know, the financial side of things and being comfortable um, has a massive impact on that. Uh, I'd never, you know, no matter how much money I earn or, or what position I'm in, I would never uh, it's like consider myself comfortable. I will always go outside the comfort zone. I will always push. I will always try and, you know, achieve more. Not because I want to prove anything to anyone or, or I have a big ego, just purely for myself. You know, I need that challenge. And... You know, like even right now, I'm sure everyone that's sitting at home or that, you know, are locked down in a situation that are normally really active and busy will really appreciate, like, without a goal um, and without something to push towards, you know, it's a very mundane, uh, boring lifestyle, in my opinion. Um, and if I don't have that push or I don't have that drive or that, that carrot, that dangling carrot in the future, then there's not really much to work towards in my opinion well i mean some people respond a lot better to more pressure so you're probably yeah. one of those guys that yeah, so. wants the pressure of the academy and the school all of, it, all of the pressure yeah. Yeah. a million percent 
it is like there's like without that just this is this is personal to me without that i don't like i don't feel like i'm i'm doing the best i can do without all the pressure or without all of the people or you know i say people but you know i know people are going to watch and they're going to say oh you know you can't do that with that and do that like you know there's no way you can do it. like them them comments and them thoughts that i know people have whether they say them or not or voice them or not is another matter those thoughts that people do have and you know that they have them um is something that i really uh like encourage um and then when you know you achieve your goal that people didn't think is possible um it's a great feeling not because you've proved anybody wrong but because you know you know you're doing something a little bit um out there or a little bit past what people think you're capable of and in in life in general you know from the, mm. the childhood and from the, the school situation mm. uh, I've really responded to that really well and that's always became like a, a big motivating factor for me now you know what I mean like if people tell me I can't then you know, I'm gonna do it twice and that's kind of my mindset right so we've got to get on to the whole knee injury what happened yeah well mm. um <laughs> crazy um i was obviously it was the it was the second round of the euros my first opponent didn't show up so uh i wasn't too warm i went against a good guy um very good guy that people have told me about it's very good i felt great um i had a really good camp towards it um felt super strong he was a super strong guy so i did provide who, who was it? Who was it? um ulysses something i think he's won the abu dhabi world pro um, he's really good in Portugal. He's from a Portuguese academy. He's quite good. Uh, I believe he was like on the world rankings. I think he's number four or five. He took my spot after he won. Uh, and so um, I went against him. He felt super strong, felt good. So I decided to uh, pull guard because he, he had quite a good uh, judo game, which is quite rare for me to pull guard anyway. But I uh, played a little bit of guard. Um, and I just knew like during the fight, like I felt good. And I knew at any point I could sweep. Like, I really knew that I could just come up uh, to the top. So, because of his physicality and I knew any time I went to do something, he would go, like, you know, mad. He was a very, like, scrappy guy. So, I thought, okay, I will I will wait till, like, you know, the last minute or so, come up to the top, consolidate position, 2-0 win, through to the semis, uh, and then go from there. Um, so, as I was coming up to the sweep at the end, my heel got caught inside his knee. And then as I came up, like, essentially, um, my heel went past my body to the wrong side. Ooh. So, if my, like, if I was doing this, like, this with my knee now, it, like, yeah. went the wrong way. Um, and then, literally, like, I swear to God, it, it was the most excruciating pain I've ever felt. Uh, obviously, I was f- f- screaming. Um, my knee uh, had dislocated and my foot was pointing the wrong way. Oh, so when I looked down, obviously <laughs> yeah. I, I initially really panicked because I've yeah. never seen my body distort in any way. Like, yeah. I think if you injure yourself, it's it, you know it's painful and, and it's bad. But when I looked down and I seen that my body was not right, like physically, I like I felt like this crazy like I was like super focused, like this surge of energy that was yeah. like I was really wired and switched on and, and panicking. And I think that's probably you know adrenaline. Um, I looked down, my foot's on the wrong way. So I straightened my leg as quickly as I can. Like I kicked my leg straight and, and I seen my kneecap flick. I was like, okay. And my ankle was straight then. So I knew my leg was straight. Um, I was obviously still screaming and, and a little bit of that was relief because the pain had stopped because it was straight. Um, but as soon as I did it, I knew I heard, like the noise I heard come out the side of my knee was n- yeah. like nothing I've ever heard before, man. Was it quite an, a loud, audible snap or a pop? Yeah, loud, audible yeah, snap. Like and then, like, huge and then there, was a, there was like a crunch. Yeah. Like imagine you're pulling an elastic band and you hear it going, yeah. like that. And then yeah. I was like, man, I don't know what I did. Um, they strapped my foot to like a board and my knee and, and my thigh and everything. They strapped it down to a board. Yeah. Uh, took me out to the hospital, which, you know, this is no disrespect to the officials that held me in Lisbon but I think the the bush ride there was more dangerous than the fight <laughs> I swear man the trolley in the back was not <laughs> I was wobbling all over the back of the van 
uh, I, got to, I got to the uh, came out with black eyes and uh, yeah I got to the hospital and uh, this is what freaked me out actually I was thinking about this the other day because I got to the hospital and there was just people lying in the co- in the corridors like on beds and stuff and this is January so I thought like you know I didn't think anything of it but now over the past few days I've been thinking well maybe some of them people had what's going on right now yeah it's a conspiracy theorist in all of us but um, I got there um, they x-rayed it and and stuff like that. They said, obviously, there's no actual bone damage. Did did, did you, luckily. did they bypass, well, after the x-ray, did they go straight to MRI? Uh, no, so this is the this is the funny thing. So after the x-ray, they said, oh, we can't MRI your knee because this is, the, this is the second hospital in the city, not the first one, because they took me to the closest one. Right. So they said, if you want an MRI, you've got to go to the other one. So I said, okay, I was going to do it. Um, but then they said to me, they said, and this is why, by the way, if you don't rate the NHS or you think the NHS is a bad idea, believe me, it's the best idea on the planet because they said to me, you need to buy a pair of crutches and you need to buy a knee brace. And I thought, okay, like, I don't mind buying the things. I understand I'm abroad and, you know, we don't have the same thing. But then they said, it's in the shop at the other side of the hospital that may or may not be open because it's Saturday. They might have gone home. And I thought, hang on. So I got to the shop and the shop was shut. I thought I knew it. I knew it would be more luck that it shut. So um, I didn't have a knee brace. I didn't have a crutches. Um, and I had to go back to the hotel. I went back to the hotel, got some Uber Eats um, with, my, with my missus and fell asleep. I went to go to the toilet in the middle of the night. Mate. Then my knee was like triple, quadruple the size. Looked like an elephant's leg. Yeah. I nearly fell over going to the bathroom. There was no stability. I couldn't, and man, the pain was excruciating. I had no painkillers. So luckily my flight was on the Sunday, um, the day after I fought anyway, that evening, um, because I, not, I wanted to get back anyway home to coach. And I was hoping I'd be coming home to coach. Um, and um, got home. I went and had a private MRI uh, just down the road in Solihull. Uh, there's a really good place there. The MRI did. Sent the results back to my physio. Uh, the private one um yeah, cmc imaging yes yeah yeah and no, i'll refer quite a lot of patients there yeah, yeah were, i mean it, it was pretty cheap how much, how much did you pay for it if you don't yeah i think it's about 200 pounds yeah yeah that's brilliant that you is, know it's, got, you know, yeah, it's crazy. you know i'd rather do that than wait eight weeks and then have to go through the recovery process in my absolutely. opinion absolutely absolutely um, yeah. yeah so i had an MRI I've heard a lot of people there it's a good place they, yeah, they really good. results over to um, the physio I work with and, and have been working with. Um, oh, who's that? Give me, give me a little uh, shout out. She's called uh, Syra Remen. She owns the um, Resolve Physiotherapy. She owns the one in uh, Four Oaks and one at Velocity Training Club. Brilliant. Um, but she's super good. Um, and because she knows me fairly well now, uh, and my, you know, she knows my missus and stuff, she brings the kids to the kids' class. I think she knows how to manage... Like how my personality is as well. So when we're scanning my knee and, and we're working through what we're working through, I think she knows what to say and do to motivate me. The same as you know, my missus, my family, mm. they really support in uh, like helping me get back to fitness. What was what was the diagnosis? What was the outcome of the MRI? Um, diagnosis was ninety uh, percent tears in the LCL. Um, I had a tear, a slight tear and bleeding on the ACL. Uh, the popliteus muscle or popliteus muscle, I don't know how you say it, was a 90% tear. Um, yeah. So basically everything was hanging on by a thread um, in, in their eyes. Is that's how they explained it to me. So the initial treatment was just literally to immobilize it for two, three weeks, work through a strength and conditioning program, um, train as much as you can, stretch as much as you can. I had a few massages. I had a few treatments uh, done to my knee. Um, and literally within, I think it took me eight weeks, uh, and it was fully recovered and fully healed. Uh, we ultrasounded the LCL, it's just on the outside, isn't it? So you can see it fairly well. Yeah. Uh, and it was fully repaired and healed. And then oh, this, is, this was an ultrasound scan, not. The, yeah, just an ultrasound yeah. scan on the outside Brilliant. just to see if it was fusing <clears throat> together well. And, you know, there's yeah. a little bit of scar tissue and strip that out and carry on and keep doing what we was doing, which was, you know, working really well. Um, I was still sparring each night at the gym with the students with the brace on, um, which like, you know, she wasn't too happy about, but for my mental health was important. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then about two weeks ago, 
I was cleared to go back to normal full training. Uh, I was going to go over to Nottingham, but I, f- I always say this with an injury, with a serious injury. As soon as I say you're ready, I, I always keep on for two weeks uh, because I know myself and I know what level I want to be pushing at and I'm going to push to that level whether my body's with me or not and I didn't want to re-injure it or you know cause any pain or problem so um, I just uh, give it another two weeks off and then unfortunately this whole situation uh, began with the virus so uh, I haven't trained still yet so it's going to be a few more uh, weeks or months that I train but you know I'm just conscious of the time we've got a couple of minutes left um, yeah how how's it going now that you can't deliver face to face? How is that? How are you overcoming this? Um, well, we're doing a lot of like uh, Zoom classes, like uh, how we how me and you are now. Uh, I'm going on there. Um, I'm doing the you know the theme of the weeks as best I can. Yeah, there you go. There's a perfect one. That's sparring, buddy. <laughs> um, I've been using a lot of the time as well for the students to do a lot more Q and A's. Um, yeah. Just because I think, like, with the structure in the gym, which is great and it works, it's hugely successful and, you know, people get good really quick. Um, sometimes, apart from the open mat, which we have on a Friday, there's limited um, chances for them to ask me questions, you know, unless they book a private session or we're talking outside of the gym. You know, they don't get to ask me as much as, you know, I'd like sometimes because I like my brain to be engaged and, and challenged uh, and that's how I learn and adapt as a coach. If someone comes to me with a problem or a question, I actually sometimes get a lot more out of it than they do uh, by, you know, looking back at what I would do in that situation and maybe learning something new or adapting a, an old concept to make it work. Um, so we've been doing a lot of that when they come on to, to the Zoom. They, they ask a lot of questions. Um, fortunately, um, my dad started training about uh, about 12 weeks ago. Oh, cool. Uh, at the gym, yeah. So... Uh, he's been coming on to the webcam with me as like, you know, helping me out as a sister. Oh, he's the one I've been seeing on the, he's your, your model. He's, been, yeah. he's the one you've been strangling. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's always fun, by the way. You can't, you can't complain when you get strangled with your dad. Um, but, um, so he's been helping me out a lot uh, with that as well. Uh, and we've been trying to deliver the best we can. But obviously, like, you know, these, this current time and, and the way things are, it's not easy. Um, we can only hope that you know our students uh, and the community as a whole look out for each other, you know, protect each other. If, you know, if we're still earning money or our wages are covered, that we continue, you know, to pay our fees and and to help out. And you know, I will always do that as well. Um, that's just how I am as a person. You know, any of my students, I can help. Any advice that they need or they want, I try and give outside of the mats and on the mats. Uh, and I think you know we all have a, a good relationship. Like, don't get me wrong, of course. You know, the more your academy expands and, and the more people you have, um, you know, sometimes you can lose uh, that more personal uh, touch because you don't know everyone as well as you wish, uh, which I think is natural. And, and I think everybody goes through that. Uh, but as much as I can, I try to keep it as you know personal as I can and, and really invest my time in each uh, student to help them as much as I can. And, and right now, like, you know, for 16 hours a day, I'm not doing anything anyway. Um, so now's the perfect time to really build relationships with some of those students that you may not see so often or you may not know too much about, um, you know, help them uh, develop as well. Because when I first started, like I said, when I was at the community centre, we, you know, we had a group of like, you know, 30 guys training. It was a lot easier to literally keep on top of them, at, like person to person. I would even know, you know, where they go out, what they're doing for work, when they've got to get up early, when they've got to get up late. Like literally I would know them that well because there was only a few of them um, that it was like a super personal like service almost. Um, and then, like I say, you know, when you, when you build on your numbers and you expand, it's, it can be difficult to do that, but as much as we can, we try. And I also have those original members that were there from the beginning and understand me uh, and, and my vision for the Academy. They equally now uh, contact those outside of the gym uh, you know, send them a WhatsApp message or an Instagram message to keep them engaged, you know, ask them how they're getting on. And I think they really just try and do what I did with them at the very beginning uh, to everybody else to keep everybody engaged. And like I said, techniques aside and physical activity aside, I think it's the most crucial thing that, you know, we all get on webcam and, you know, we all get dressed in the morning and we can have a chat and we can, you know, stay connected. 
yeah, you know, at times like yeah. this, if we don't, if, we, if you don't do that as humans, like you just lose your head. I yeah. think you really do. Like, absolutely. Like, well, I've been well. looking forward to this podcast all day. I was, <laughs> I was looking, honestly, I was looking forward to, you know, the the class earlier that was six yeah. or seven. I've been looking forward to it all day from yeah. like nine a.m. Yeah. And the thing is, right. what I've really noticed, and what I think everyone will notice from this situation, those things that would normally bug you, or you would think, oh, man, how am I going to fit that in? Like, oh, how am I going to do that? I can't, oh, I'm not going to speak to, like, them things now have become essential, yes. and they've replaced yeah, yeah. the things that people think are really yeah. important, like yeah. your Instagram post, or how many followers you've got, and they've replaced that with the, you know what, I actually need to message this person, I'm going to take half an hour out of my day to have a good productive conversation with a friend, with a relative, with someone I don't know on a podcast to give out to everybody else that's going through this period of time. Yeah. And, you know, realistically, after any world event or after anything that happens, you will never go back to being the same. It will be, you know, similar, but there'll be mm. changes that happen. And I think realistically, there will be some hugely positive, um, you know, uh, things that come out of it. Like, hopefully people won't get more than two meters after they put diesel in yeah. people will wear gloves when they refuel you know people, these crazy things yeah. that you don't do people wash their hands before they go training <laughs> mate you know what i mean when you leave the gym you put about a bit of alcohol gel on so yes yeah, yeah. You're not getting i mean that. you're right you're right hopefully yeah uh, i think it's got a lot of people thinking i mean how i'm looking at it is uh obviously with me working from home I'm getting to spend a lot of quality time. I've got a, I've got three children, um, all of different ages, but the young youngest is 16 months old, and I'm getting to see and spend so much time with them on a daily yeah. basis, which is fantastic. You know. Yeah. And, How does that feel though? Like you know, like being in control, because like I'm going to be a parent in about three months' time. Um. So I need to prepare. Yeah, I've got enough time on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, Every, like, everything. Know, you being in control of that now. Like, essentially, I've been seeing this, you know, people talking about homeschooling and, and the kids being at home. Like, genuinely, how does that, for you, feel, being in control of their, not future, because you're not going to be in control forever, but how does it feel being in control of, like, their day-to-day, -day, like, yeah. progression as, like, human beings? Is it, I'd imagine that's quite interesting to see them develop. Yeah, yeah, well, it, you know, it's only, it's only been a couple of weeks. The first... Um... The first couple of days we were very strict. Um, I mean, yeah. my wife works for the NHS, so she's still out there on a daily basis okay. doing patients. Um, and uh, and so you know, it was the very much the emphasis was right. They need to we need to mimic as much of school as possible mm. uh, in the home environment, but it just wasn't working. It's, it's just, so difficult, and it does and it doesn't work to be honest with you. And then it becomes more about not this kind of like linear way of learning, right? Let's do this, this, and this in the book. It becomes more about, right, I want you to have a think about this particular uh, concept, or I want you to think about this part of history. Let's have a chat. Let's go on the laptop and see if we can find something about it. Do you want to draw a picture? You know, they're doing Viking. My, one of my sons is doing Vikings at the moment. So it's like, you know, who do you know that's a Viking that you really like? And he was like, oh, Thor. You know, <laughs> you know, so it's just like, yeah. oh yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so, yeah, yeah. And then you know, and then the other uh, with my eldest daughter, um, it's just keeping her busy. And then my youngest, my my, my toddler, it's keeping him active. It's it's tough. It's tough. And I've still got to work. I've still I'm still managing the caseload the same way I'm talking to you. I'm talking to a lot of patients on uh -huh. a daily basis. You know, I think that's the most difficult thing about the whole situation is it because all of these things are actual jobs, they're individual jobs, like your work is an individual job, to be a teacher is an individual yeah. job, to be, you know, to help with physical activity for a kid is a job. So you're literally juggling like three, four jobs, looking, maintaining the house, cooking, like there's so many things that need to be done. So yeah, I don't envy anyone that's in that position right now. It's a very difficult position. But like we said, you know, there's so many positives you can draw but from it. Well, I think a lot of it, uh, we, I'm starting, I've been doing a lot of um, self-reflection and just thinking a lot a lot differently about stuff. I would think about what you said. I would take it for granted before um, mm. and I'm not so much now. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, There's only three months to go anyway, so you'll be all right. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so, um, we have kind of hit, we're hitting the time limit now. So, um best to look at the gym 
Um, yeah. Let's let's see what happens. Best of luck with the Zoom, got kind of coaching. Best of luck yeah. in the gym when it opens back up. I'd love to pop down eventually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do. yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, we'll pop. I'll pop down for a few sessions, and I, you know, Sutton's my old uh, stomping ground, so it'd be good to get over, catch up yeah. with some family and friends, and right, we're cool, man. Can come it's in. A good place, go, a nice place. Yeah, yeah, we can go it's grab a beer. Place. We can go grab a beer or something to eat afterwards as well, and yeah. have a catch up, and you can you can fill me in on what's been happening. Um, but yeah, good luck. Good luck with it. Uh, you know, yeah. it's it it takes a lot, mate. I'm really impressed. 24 years of age, and you've really, really thrown yourself. I mean, do you know, after I'd left the army, I'd left the army at 24. I went to work in Greece for a couple of years. I was, I was a barman. Great. Right. You know, <laughs> just, I was just running away from responsibility, and you've, <laughs> you've, you've thrown yourself in there. So I'm really impressed. And kudos to you. It's, oh, uh, you know, it's good. And listen, congratulations. I know you're expecting, you and the missus are expecting a baby soon. So, uh, you know, that's also, you know, some kudos there to you. And uh, we'll see what happens in the future. But Tom, thanks very much for your time. No, no worries. Amazing. And, Thank uh, you. I'll see you soon. Awesome, mate. Cheers, okay. buddy. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.